Hi, everyone. I'm Ben Norton, and this is Geopolitical Economy Report. I'm joined by a close friend of the show today, Radhika Desai. She is a professor in the Department of Political Studies at the University of Manitoba and the author of the book on geopolitical economy. I've been doing another series with her on her more recent book, Capitalism, Coronavirus and War, and we're going to come back to that series. But I wanted to bring on Radhika today to get her invaluable insight into the profound economic and geopolitical changes we're seeing around the world and especially the role of Europe in this. In the past few weeks, we've seen some incredible statements by leaders like the French president, Emmanuel Macron, who took a trip to China and then did an interview in which he criticized US dominance of Europe and said that Europe cannot be a vassal and simply a follower of Washington. Now, we all have criticisms of Macron and, and whether or not he's going to actually act on that rhetoric or whether it's not whether it's just discursive. That's a whole other debate. But the point is that in Europe right now, there has been a scandal that has emerged in response to Macron's comments and specifically his concept of strategic autonomy. And this is a term that we've seen members of the European political class uh, echo in the past few weeks. And specifically, we're going to look at today a speech that was made by one of the most powerful people in Europe, Christine Lagarde. Uh, she is the former French finance minister who became the director of the IMF, the International Monetary Fund. And right now she's the president of the European Central Bank, the ECB. And on April 17th, she gave a speech for the Council on Foreign Relations in New York. So it's important to keep in mind who the audience of the speech is. It's, you know, the ruling class in the United States, specifically on Wall Street. Uh, the Council on Foreign Relations is essentially the link between the U.S. State Department and Wall Street. The Rockefeller oligarchs worked closely with the CFR funding the famous War and Peace Studies project during World War II, and they helped plan the first Cold War against the Soviet Union. So when she's speaking to this organization, she's speaking specifically to the politically connected capitalists in New York. And she gave this very interesting speech in which Lagarde acknowledges the fact that the world is moving more and more in a multipolar direction. We may see the world becoming more multipolar. And she began her speech. I just want to look at a few of the comments she made. She said that we're in a moment in which the tectonic plates of geopolitics are shifting faster. The tectonic plates are shifting and they're shifting faster than we have seen. She cited the COVID pandemic, the war in Ukraine, the energy crisis, the acceleration of inflation and the growing rivalry between the United States and China. And in, in the context of this, she said very clearly, she said, we are witnessing a fragmentation of the global economy into competing blocks with each block trying to pull as much of the rest of the world closer to its respective strategic interests and shared values. So I decided to um, accept the idea, and I do that reluctantly because I don't think that it's necessarily a pretty picture, but to accept the idea that we are moving towards a fragmented or a more fragmented world than we've had it. And that we are not necessarily in a completely bipolar situation, but that we might move in that direction. We are witnessing a fragmentation of the global economy into competing blocks, with each block trying to pull as much of the rest of the world closer to its respective strategic interests and shared values. And this fragmentation, as I have mentioned, may well coalesce around two blocks led respectively by the United States of America and by China, the two largest economies in the world at the moment. This is one of the most powerful people in Europe, acknowledging that there, we're seeing an attempt really by Washington to create a bipolar world order. And Macron's comment should be taken in the context of this, where the US is trying to say you're either with China or you're with us, you have to pick a side. And she acknowledges that those blocks are not only political blocks, but they have specific interests and values. And when she says values, she's referring to a different economic ideology. Christine Lagarde herself has referred to herself as a liberal. 
she has pursued a lot of neoliberal economic policies. And, and you know, when in Europe, when people say they're liberal, they're really referring to right wing politics in the U.S. and Canada. Liberal has a different connotation. But in this speech, this is her saying that we as Europeans are caught in the middle of this increasingly bipolar conflict. And she says that we could see more multipolarity as geopolitical tensions continue to amount. And we could see more multipolarity as geopolitical tensions continue to mount. I should also point out that it's not just the comments that were made by French President Macron calling for Europe to be more independent of the U.S. and have strategic autonomy, but also there were similar comments made by the Secretary of the Treasury in the United States, Janet Yellen. She was previously the chair of the Federal Reserve, the U.S. Central Bank, and in an interview with CNN, Yellen, the Treasury Secretary, acknowledged that Washington's increasing use of sanctions has weakened the hegemony of the U.S. dollar. There is a risk when we use financial sanctions that are linked to the role of dollar, the dollar that over time it could undermine the hegemony of the dollar. So, Radhika, you have been talking about the, the multipolar world for years, and you've argued that it's not something new. It's, it's been... Uh, a thorn in the side of the United States that has tried to prevent multipolarity. But you've been talking about multipolarity for long before the political class in the West has now been using this term more and more. Olaf Scholz has talked about multipolarity, Christine Lagarde, Macron. So can you just respond to this discussion we see in Europe with politicians acknowledging that they, they potentially want to have some kind of strategic autonomy in this multipolar world? Yeah, you know, uh, this is exactly, you know, the, the in a certain sense, you know, reading Christine Lagarde's speech and putting it in the context, as you rightly uh, said, of other pronouncements coming from uh, uh, from uh, important European figures, including Macron, etc. What are we seeing essentially? What we are looking at here is that these people, the, so the Western leadership in general, uh, initially tried in the context of the conflict over Ukraine over the last year and more, initially tried to sort of uh, uh, pretend that somehow, you know, anything that was going wrong were just sort of little local difficulties. They were going to blow over. Everything was going to be just fine with the dollar's hegemony, with the West's imperial power, etc., etc. And I think that increasingly they have been, they have had to realize, you know, year has gone by, particularly over the last uh, 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 six months or so, uh, the dollar has been declining. The uh, U.S.'s fight against inflation is not doing very well. And of course, more recently, we've had the financial crisis, the opening, I should say, the opening salvos of a financial crisis crisis, which is going to be with us for a long time. So in this context, I think they are finally admitting uh, what, as you rightly pointed out, Christine Lagarde is saying, the world is dividing into two camps, multipolarity, etc. And in fact, she could have used the word bipolarity, but she's probably uh, with a view to a European uh, perspective in mind, she still uses the word multipolarity because I think on the one hand, you know, by nodding to common Western values, etc., she is somehow trying to uh, uh, reassure an American audience to whom she is speaking, the, essentially the American foreign policy establishment, that, you know, Europe is with you. But at the same time, she's also sort of saying, well, you know what, we also have our concerns and somewhere in this uh, not very long uh, 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 speech in a strategic place she inserts the reference to the necessity of Europe's strategic autonomy, which is something, uh, especially given that the Biden administration is trying to corral as many countries as possible, certainly all of Europe, uh, behind US policy. So, so I would say that this is what we are reading here is what this phenomenon of multipolarity looks like from the point of view of the West in general, who are, have been the losers of it, so they've had to admit it, and what do, what does a European policymaker make of it? And to me, uh, uh, Ben, it's very interesting that she focuses so squarely on inflation, because I think this, in many ways, this point about inflation goes to the nub 
of the issue of multipolarity, which ultimately, what is it, but a diminution in the power of imperialism. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, toward the beginning of her speech, she does this very brief historical outline. And what's funny about this historical outline is she's essentially acknowledging the analysis that you and I share, the anti-imperialist analysis, but she's saying that imperialism is a good thing and that Europe benefited from it. Specifically, she says that after the Cold War, the world benefited from a remarkably favorable geopolitical environment under the hegemonic leadership of the United States. She uses the H word hegemony. And then she says, under US imperial leadership, it led to a deepening of global value chains. And as China joined the world economy, a massive increase in the global labor supply. And specifically, she's referring to cheap labor that Western capital could exploit and how that was a significant factor in the low inflation that we saw in the peak of this unipolar moment. And let's remember the decades after the Cold War. The world benefited from a remarkably favorable geopolitical environment. Under the hegemonic leadership of the United States, rule-based international institutions flourished and global trade expanded. And this led to a deepening of global chain. And as China joined the world economy, soon the WTO, a massive increase in the global labor supply took place. And as a result, global supply became more elastic to changes in domestic demand, leading to a long period of relatively low and stable inflation. What's interesting about this comment is there was an even more shockingly honest comment made by Joseph Borrell, who is the de facto foreign minister of the European Union. He made a comment in which he said that the cheap labor in China and cheap energy from Russia did more than all of the central banks in the world combined to combat inflation. So our prosperity was based on China and Russia. Energy, a market. You, U.S. takes care of our security. You, China and Russia provide the basis of our prosperity. This is a world that is no longer there. Our prosperity has been based on cheap energy coming from Russia, Russian gas, cheap and suppose affordable and secure and stable, which has been proved not the case, and the access to the big China market for exports and imports, for technological uh, transfer, for investment and for having cheap goods. I think that the Chinese workers with their low salaries has done much better and much more to contain inflation than all the central banks together. So our prosperity was based on China and Russia. Energy, a market. So you, Radhika, when, when we were talking about the speech that Lagarde gave, you pointed out that what was favorable for the West in what she referred to as this remarkably favorable geopolitical environment of US hegemony. What was good for the West was bad for the rest of the world. So she's portraying this with rosy, retrospe re rosy retrospection with you know this, these rose tinted glasses, but you pointed out that the rest of the world didn't see it that way. Yeah, exactly. I mean, you know, when she's talking about, first of all, she says the world benefited from a remarkably favorable geopolitical environment. No, the first world benefited. And then she refers to the hegemonic leadership of the United States. And if you take the system of dollar hegemony, you know, the, there are essentially two, two foundations on which so-called U.S. hegemony. And as you know, I've always questioned that notion that there ever was such a thing. But nevertheless, uh, well, that is to say whether the U.S. ever succeeded in accomplishing its uh, 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 a stable dominance over the world order. But nevertheless, what it means is U.S. military power on the one hand, but also equally importantly, U.S. Uh, uh, the U.S. dollar system. And if we look a little bit more closely at it, let's just count the the variety in practically every major respect, the dollar system has been not good for the third world, not good for the vast majority of countries in the world that are not 
Western that do not have a place in the G7 where they can coordinate macroeconomic policy and make sure that US allies don't get too badly burned by the US dollar system. Although they have been badly burned by it as well, as we saw in 2008, Europe outside the United States, Europe, uh, including the U UK in this instance, was the chief uh, victim of the 2008 financial crisis, which I like to call the North Atlantic financial crisis. But let's let's look at the third world. First of all, the dollar system systematically undervalues the currencies of the third world. And when you undervalue a currency, what you're doing is you're undervaluing the resources and the labor of those countries. Precisely, this is the mechanism by which the West has managed to get uh, access to the resources and the labor of these countries cheaply. And that also means that the, that the rest of the world has to sell their resources for a song and to work doubly hard, triply hard in, in order to sell, you know, they, they, they have to send a massive volume of goods, uh, export a massive volume of goods to Western countries in order to earn Western hard currencies, including the dollar, because their money is systematically undervalued in relation to this. So that there's always been a big discrepancy between the volume of exports and the value of exports, which of course is uh, artificially lowered by the bad exchange rate. Secondly, the uh, dollar financial system has given the world nothing but a series of crises after crises, a great deal of volatility. You know, an international medium of currency ought to have a stable value, but the dollar's value keeps fluctuating. Um, another problem and a large part of the volatility and the tendency to crisis comes from the fact that, you know, whereas a proper monetary system should be based on a sort of a, a balanced environment, the dollar systematically has required imbalances. The chief among them, of course, being the vast U.S. current account deficits, which have uh, uh, which have the rest of the world has to finance them, but also the imbalances that are created by the U.S. Uh, uh, dollar system dollar uh, centered financial system, which has been on the one hand creating vast amounts of unsustainable dollar debt, uh, indebting households, indebting businesses and indebting governments around the world. And on the other hand, blowing up asset bubbles so that uh, 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 U.S. financial institutions and high net worth individuals can make a killing with the uh, uh, inflation of asset values. But this, of course, only leads to the crash of these or the bursting of these bubbles. And this has created more problems. Further, the third world is told that the U.S. has a very sophisticated financial system. It's great. It's going to provide you with uh, uh, um you know, uh, 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 the, the, the capital you sorely need for development. But of course, in reality, the US focused financial system offers the opposite of that because capital for productive investment, which indeed the third world and the rest of the world really needs, it needs to be stable long term capital that is able to invest for a long period in, in infrastructure projects in projects that have long gestation periods, but eventually are very important and good for the economy. But this is not the sort of capital that the US financial system offers. Instead, the US financial system offers short term capital that only goes to inflate the value of existing assets rather than investing productively in the creation of new goods and services. So the rest of the world is told, you know, lift your capital account restrictions, allow free capital flows, and you will get the capital you want. In fact, what the third world gets is the opposite of that, the capital they don't want. Hot money that comes stampeding in when these investors who are not particularly knowledgeable think things are good, and hot money that stampedes out at the slightest sign of a problem, thanks to equally ignorant investors, leaving behind uh, a financial crises, credit crises, currency crises, and of course, economic crises. Um, a couple of other points that one should also add to this. Number one, this system, particularly this debt crisis, third world debt crisis onwards, has enforced a system of debtor responsibility, completely ignoring that any credit relationship has two relatively equal parts and if things go sour, if things go wrong, if a debt cannot be paid, both debtor and creditor are co-responsible for the problem. Instead, all the, uh, 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 the the weight of adjustment, the weight of repayment, etc., has been uh, has been on the debtors. And as you know, this is the 
chief mechanism by which so much money is being drained out of debtor countries, which are the vast majority of countries in the third world, and goes into the coffers of the rich countries. And finally, one final point, given that this system has been so awful, Naturally, countries have wanted to leave it. And what has the US done historically uh, 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 to, to countries that have wanted to leave it? It has essentially waged war against them. Think of Saddam Hussein. Think of Muammar Gaddafi. What was crucial about these two leaders? It was the fact that one of their key projects in each case was a project to leave the dollar system and uh, 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 try to create an alternative to the dollar system. And this is why they were essentially deposed killed uh, in gruesome ways uh, in the case of Gaddafi and uh, and of course their countries have been left uh, uh, essentially prey to all sorts of uh, uh, military and uh, political financial and economic instability so this is not a system and so naturally finally now the rest of the world has alternatives and the United States can't even wage a war to force the third world back to the dollar system. But Ms. Lagarde, in her speech, seems to portray all this as being good for the world. So you can just see, the even when she's sort of beginning to realize certain truths, how far she remains from the real truth of the matter. That's absolutely right. I mean, when we hear comments from people like Lagarde and from Macron, I mean, clearly, it's nice to hear them criticize U.S. hegemony and say that they should have more autonomy. But then you you hear the other comments that they make and you still see that they do very much embody this neo-colonial ideology that persists in much of the, the European political class. I should point out that it's not only toward the global south, but even the south of the Eurozone itself. Uh, Lagarde is notorious for, she made a comment during the Greek sovereign debt crisis around 2012, following the financial cr crisis of 2008, she said that it's payback time, famously, referring, that's how sensitive she was to the plight in Greece, where austerity was being imposed on the people of Greece with huge rates of unemployment and growing poverty. And she said, it's payback time. But but anyway, um, in, in terms of her speech, and in terms of this European ideology that just shows how blinkered her, her worldview is, she continued going on in her speech and talking about the so-called Pax Americana. During the Pax Americana, after 1945, the US dollar became firmly ensconced as the global reserve and transaction currency. Anytime someone uses that term in a serious way, if they're not deriding it, I mean, I can't take them seriously because I don't know how anyone can believe there was a so-called Pax Americana after World War II, considering the war in Korea, the war in Vietnam, the war in Yugoslavia. I mean, even the idea that there was no war in Europe is false because NATO destroyed Yugoslavia. But anyway, she says that after the end of World War II and the rise of Pax Americana, she said the dollar became firmly ensconced as the global reserve and transaction currency. And more recently, the euro has risen to second place. This has had a range of mostly beneficial implications for central banks. More recently, the euro, which is only a young currency, uh, has risen to the second place, to the point where today the US dollar is about 60% of international reserve, the euro is 20%, and the other 20% is shared between renminbi, yen, sterling, Australian dollars, Canadian dollars, and a few other currencies as well. Not all necessarily in the SDR basket, but quite spread out. This had a range of mostly beneficial implication for central banks. So again, this idea that it's been beneficial for everyone. She doesn't say just for Western central banks, she says for all central banks. And then she talks about the rise of Western payment infrastructure. Specifically, she mentions the SWIFT interbank messaging system. And I actually want to play a clip where she talks about the rise of other alternative payment systems that we've seen more recently in response to Western sanctions. And she discusses the countries that are trying to use alternative currencies like the Chinese renminbi or the Indian rupee and the increased accumulation of gold as an alternative reserve asset. Here's that clip. So Western payment infrastructure assumed an increasingly global role. 
For instance, in the decade after the Berlin Wall fell, the number of countries using the payment messaging networks called SWIFT more than doubled. And by 2020, over 90% of cross-border transmissions were being signaled through SWIFT. But new trade patterns may have ramifications for payments and international currency reserves. In recent decades, China has already increased over 130-fold its bilateral trade in goods with emerging markets and developing economies, with the country also becoming the world's top exporter. And recent research indicates that there is a significant correlation between a country's trade with China and its holding in renminbi as reserves. New trade patterns may also lead to new alliances. One study finds that alliances can increase the share of a currency in the partner's reserve holdings by roughly 30 percentage point. Now, all this could create opportunities for certain countries seeking to reduce their dependency on our Western payment system and currency frameworks. Be that for reasons of political preferences, financial dependency, or because of the sanctions that have been imposed for, dec for a decade now. Anecdotal evidence, including official statements, suggests that some countries intend to increase their use of alternative currencies for invoicing international trade, such as the Chinese renminbi or the Indian rupee. We are also seeing increased accumulation of gold as an alternative reserve asset, possibly driven by countries much closer geopolitically to China and to India. There are also attempts to actually override or set up an alternative system to SWIFT. Since 2014, Russia has developed such a system for domestic and cross-border use with over 50 banks across a dozen countries using it last year. The accurate data in those uh, matters are a bit difficult to assess, as you can imagine, but based on what we see, it's probably still the case that those banks in those 12 countries are using this alternative uh, system. And since 2015, China has established its own system to clear all payments in renminbi. Now, these developments, and here I would agree with Krugman uh, in the time this morning, these developments do not point to an imminent loss of dominance for the US dollar or for the euro, the former being far more dominant than the latter. So, so far, the data do not show substantial changes in the use of international currencies. But they do suggest that international currency status should no longer be taken for granted and that we should be really attentive to the currency in which trade transactions are organized. And that is, in my view, particularly the case for oil. So in response to that, Lagarde claims that we do not anticipate an immediate imminent loss of dominance for the US dollar and euro, but you've pointed out that, that she fails to understand the internal contradiction. She is acknowledging the inevitable drive toward de-dollarization that we see gaining momentum around the world, but she still insists that, yes, the dollar is going to remain on top. <laughs> Yeah, uh, you know, this is the thing. I mean, you know, she she's, as, as we were saying earlier, she has finally been forced to acknowledge that the dollar system uh, is not working well, at least according to, you know, for reasons actually she doesn't give, probably because she does not fully understand, uh, as we've just been talking, why the rest of the world would seek alternatives to the dollar. But she does acknowledge that these alternatives are increasingly available and that uh, many countries in the rest of the world are beginning to use these alternatives. But, you know, the demise of the dollar, which has been, I would say, a long and ongoing process. In fact, I've argued that the dollar has never uh, stably served as the world's money. It has always relied on all sorts of extremely volatile and problematic arrangements, which has only which have only been bad for the world. Nevertheless, so 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 the, so that she, she she does not uh, um, uh, uh, go into this. But if you look at it, the current accelerated demise of the dollar system rests on two pillars. One uh, is that the internal contradictions of the dollar system are mounting, and then the other is that in that context. Next, 
increasingly largely thanks to china but also the initiatives taken by many other countries alternatives are becoming available so it is the two things together that is creating the problem and the internal contradictions of the dollar system can be simply viewed as as the following in this century particularly the us has is said well through, since 1971 the us has essentially tried to the us and federal reserve in particular has tried to keep the dollar attractive to the world despite US deficits, despite the US's uh, inability to pay its way in the world, both in trade terms and in uh, capital and payments terms. It has tried to keep dollars flowing or keep money flowing into the dollar system by creating a series of financial series of expansions of financial activity. Now I say series because each of these has been volatile, contradictory, and it has collapsed. And then when it has the, 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 the Federal Reserve and the US authorities have replaced it with another one. So beginning with the vast expansion of lending in the 1970s, the big uh, 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 Japan buying loads and loads of uh, uh, US treasuries in the 80s, the, uh, uh, the Asian uh, the bubbles in various Asian countries in the mid 90s, the dot com bubble in the late 90s, uh, the housing and credit bubble and today's everything bubble, all of these essentially are sort of a, a, a games in the U, a casino that the US has opened since the 1970s, inviting the world to send in dollars. But you know what, after 2008, even these have not been enough. And the Federal Reserve as a consequence has had to prop up a number of asset markets by buying these assets directly under the so-called quantitative easing program, which has inflated the Federal Reserve's balance sheet to over $9 trillion today, uh, when in fact, in the early part of this century, it was still only about $1 trillion. So uh, what, what we're trying to say is that th these contradictions are mounting, and especially given that at this point in time, with inflation rising, and by the way, I don't believe the inflation is due to the money printing that has gone on. Certainly money printing has gone on, but I would say that's not chiefly responsible for the inflation. Um, but nevertheless, so the, with rising inflation, which is happening because of its own reasons, the Federal Reserve is caught in a bind. If it does not tackle inflation, the dollar's value will decline further. But at the same time, the very means with which it can, the only means it can permit itself to use to tackle inflation, which is raising interest rates, is bound to bring down the financial house of cards on which the financializations that have made the dollar attractive and the financializations that are at the foundation of the wealth of the richest Americans, this financial house of cards will collapse as we have already seen the collapse is already started because the interest rates have gone up to about 5% or so or just below 5%. So this is these are the inter internal contradictions of the dollar system and they are mounting as well. But you wouldn't know it from Ms. Lagarde's speech. Yeah, and that's why I keep going back to that quote that the de facto European Union foreign minister Borrell made in which he acknowledged that cheap labor from China and cheap energy from Russia was responsible for keeping inflation lower than all central bank policy combined. I think that the Chinese workers with their low salaries has done much better and much more to contain inflation that all the central banks together. So our prosperity was based on China and Russia. Energy, a market. That's a very revealing quote because he's acknowledging that it's not simply moving up and down the interest rate and, the, and controlling the money supply that influences inflation. You know, the, the monetarist ideology of Milton Friedman, the neoliberal Chicago boy ideology tells us that inflation is always and everywhere a monetary phenomenon. But you've stressed that a huge part of this is because of the profound geopolitic, geopolitical and economic shifts that we've seen, especially in the global south, as, uh, particularly related to compensation for labor in the global south. So rising wages in Asia and commodities prices. And we've seen that the United States has tried to keep commodities prices very low. And for instance, in 2014, I've done some reporting on a very important event that that's not that well known when the US did this two pronged full frontal assault on major oil producers, specifically targeting Russia, Iran and Venezuela, where the US pressured Saudi Arabia to massively increase its oil production to to plunge the price of oil in the global market. 
And that was to try to hurt the Russian economy because of the beginning of the proxy war in Ukraine after the US backed Maidan coup in, in February 2014. But also at the same time, the United States massively increased its own internal energy production through shale. I mean, they reached peak shale very quickly, but through shale production. And it was basically an, an, a political attempt to crash global commodities markets, which did economic damage to Russia, Iran, and Venezuela, which were Washington's main targets. But it also did significant economic damage to other countries that were not directly involved, like Brazil, for instance, and was a factor leading up to the 2016 political coup against Dilma Rousseff. Anyway, the point is that this idea that inflation is simply, a, it's all because of the, the wise sages at the central banks who just control interest rates. No, it's clearly much, much more complicated than that. You argued that, in fact, this speech by Lagarde, uh, it actually corroborates the argument the analysis of imperialism and its relation to the value of the dollar by the political economists Utsa Patnaik and Prabhat Patnaik, who have a brilliant book to understand imperialism, which is called A Theory of Imperialism. And you pointed out, when we, our discussion we had before this interview today, you pointed out that uh, it has parallels as well to the arguments being made by the economist Sultan Posar, who was previously at Credit Suisse and has this idea of commodity encumbrance. So I'm wondering if you can talk about the role of commodity prices and labor prices in all of this. Yeah, you know, uh, I mean, in general, I would say that, uh, uh, well, uh, key two key reasons, I mean, you know, you can have roughly three reasons for for having inflation. Uh, and, and this has to do incidentally with the three things that are deeply involved in all economies, but at the same time, they are not commodities uh, and therefore their prices obey certain other rules than the prices of commodities. The prices of commodities in any decently functioning capitalism should normally be on a downward trend, creating a tendency toward deflation rather than inflation. But inflation can happen, number one, yes, it can happen due to mismanagement of money by central banks. So money is the first thing that's not a commodity and that can give rise to inflation. But I say in this instance that money is not causing inflation because uh, uh, the all the money creation by the Federal Reserve and for that matter by the ECB has actually not gone into the pockets of the ordinary Joe and Jane in order to drive up consumer prices. It has gone largely into the black holes that are the balance sheets of uh, financial institutions in order to plug them, in order to fill them up. So all this money creation has gone there. It has not gone into the economy and it is not I would say, primarily causing inflation. The second reason you can have inflation is rising wages, which is not generally, you know, we have lived, uh, we are coming out of a, a world in which we, uh, wages, after many decades, wages are just beginning to rise and they are still not keeping up with inflation. But yes, there is a time when if you have tight labor markets, then wages can rise. And finally, Commodity prices. Commodity prices are very important because commodities, are, and I'm talking here about primary commodities like oil, of course, uh, but also things like copper, wheat, uh, etc., so various metals and so on. These things go into the production of so many different things that their prices have ripple effects. If their prices rise or decline, this has ripple effects on the rest of production in the economy. And these two things can easily destabilize the value of money by creating inflation, therefore devaluing money by contrast. And uh, we have seen that in historic periods of crisis of capitalism, these inevitably have a big role to play. So in the 1970s, we saw that both labor militancy, particularly in Western countries, and also the militancy of third world countries demanding higher prices for their commodities and generally commodity prices going up. Also, because third world countries themselves, once they start industrializing, start demanding uh, commodity price, uh, more, uh, more commodities. And in the case of both labor and commodities, it's not a tap you can easily turn on and off. It takes a long time to uh, invest in the exploitation of natural resources. Agricultural production is seasonal and cyclical. Uh, and of course, uh, it's not so easy to suddenly pony up more people to work, uh, you actually have to bear and rear those children in the first place. So for all these reasons, the supply of these things is relatively inelastic. And as a consequence, they tend to give rise to inflation. Now, 
the Patnayaks have historically, and they have, uh, I would say, uh, they have done a very good thing. You know, so many theories of, in, uh, of uh, uh, imperialism focus on the need for markets and investment outlets. But the Patnayaks have doggedly pointed out one other aspect of imperialism, and that is that imperialism also relies on procuring labor and raw materials cheaply and, uh, and and essentially the low value of of commodities particularly uh, and bulk of which are found in third world countries and and essentially in the non western countries the prices of these commodities if they go up and they can go up for a variety of reasons including the development of third world countries then this is going to be against the interests of first world countries because as you know the prices of say the dollar as a metropolitan currency and commodities move in opposite directions if gold goes up if oil goes up the dollar goes down so essentially this is the mechanism to which they are pointing so imperialism the mechanics of imperialism must in a variety of ways ensure that the prices of commodities remain low and and this is done by uh, 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 policies such as those of structural adjustment, for example, which essentially make it impossible for third world countries to develop. It is done, as you pointed out, by employing, say, Saudi Arabia and other commodity producers as swing producers who can always be asked to increase the supply of a certain commodity if the price is going up. Although, of course, as we now know, Saudi Arabia is no longer willing to play that role. So in that sense, it is the diminishing capacity of imperialism to ensure low prices of commodities that is part of the picture here and that Ms. Lagarde is very concerned about. She knows that uh, both a high rising wages in, in particularly in China and uh, a higher prices of commodities in the rest of the world is going to affect inflation. And she even says we are looking at in the short run a, a core inflation rate of at least about five percent uh, or in the medium term. So this is this is not comfortable news, especially for countries that cannot afford high interest rates, which is the only way they have of dealing with inflation. I mean, Ms. Lagarde talks about another way. We can talk about that. Um, but uh, anyway, so this is not very good news for them. And of course, in terms of low uh, labor prices, it's also very interesting. You know, uh, the, on the one hand, you have all this talk about, you know, too many people in this world and overpopulation, etc. But it is actually very difficult for the United States and, and Western companies generally to invest in the vast majority of the world. They need special conditions to obtain. And in general, by the way, foreign direct investment in the rest of the world is very tiny. What has happened over the last two or three decades is increasing amounts of outsourcing in which companies in the rest of the world, whether it is Indonesia or China or whatever, they these companies, Indonesian companies or Chinese companies make their own investment and then they agree to supply certain goods based on certain specifications to certain U.S. Corporations. So this is not an investment relationship. It's basically a market relationship. And this type of outsourcing when it has taken place in countries like China with a very good developmental uh, uh, orientation to their policy, it has resulted essentially in these companies climbing up the value chain and essentially no longer being willing to supply the United States with cheap products. And this is also what is affecting and creating interest, uh, uh, creating um, uh, inflation in the rest uh, uh, in the world in general, but particularly in the Western countries. Yeah, absolutely brilliant analysis. And in her speech, the European Central Bank President Lagarde, she portrays she goes through this very brief historical summary of what she refers to as Pax Americana and all of that. And then she dwells in particular on the 1970s and draws clear parallels between what she refers to as a geopolitical crisis in the 70s. Oh, and she mentions OPEC, so specifically obliquely acknowledging the 1973 OPEC oil lockout. In the 70s, central banks faced upheaval in the geopolitical environment as OPEC became more assertive and energy prices that had been stable for decades ballooned. I would also add, I mean, this is at, at a time when right after Bretton Woods 1 ends and the dollar is delinked from gold and the Nixon shock. But... When she talks about that period, she, of course, removes, she mentions that it, it was a geopolitical environment is her term, but she doesn't actually 
analyze the geopolitical environment, which is decolonization, national liberation struggle. She doesn't mention that. Instead, she refers to it simply as a mistake that was made by the technocrats who want run Western central banks. That's the way she sees the world, that we made a mistake by failing to provide an anchor of monetary stability and inflation expectations de-anchored. Central banks at the time failed to provide an anchor of monetary stability and inflation expectations de-anchored. A mistake that should not be repeated for as long as central banks are independent and have clear price stability mandates. So it was entirely because Western central banks didn't, didn't move the, the numbers around correctly. Again, not, not being able to see that I see 1970s really as this moment, the peak of the national liberation struggles that unfortunately by the end of the decade were beaten back and we saw counter-revolution with the rise of neoliberalism in the 1980s and the decline of the anti-colonial struggles. But anyway, there, are, there have been a lot of parallels made between the 1970s and this moment of stagflation, as it was known, where Western economies, especially the US economy, was stagnant and it had increasing consumer price index inflation. There have been parallels between, made between today and that, that period. And even according to the IMF's recent economic forecast, it shows that growth in the so-called emerging markets in the global south will be much larger. And China is going to be the leader of global economic growth with between 5 and 6% GDP growth. Whereas in European countries, I mean, across the entire Eurozone, it's barely above zero. It's like 0.7%. And in some countries like Britain, they're expecting a recession. And that, that's, of course, that's just nominal GDP. It's just net GDP. It's not, it's not considering real GDP, which is actually technically declining. So we, de we do see stagnation, stagflation in, in Europe in particular. Um, what do you think of Lagarde's parallels between what's happening now and what happened in the 1970s? Well, you know, Ben, I mean, my own view is that um, essentially the, uh, the, the present crisis is just another chapter in the unfolding of the crisis that began in the 1970s and was never resolved. Essentially, what happened is you got the crisis in the 1970s uh, of the, uh, and, 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 and they, they, there could have been a left wing way of resolving it, which would have been better for the world as a whole, for working people, for third world countries. But this was not the road taken and the world took a neoliberal way out of the crisis. But neoliberalism has never managed to resolve the crisis. Instead of uh, reviving economies productively, all it has done is created increasing financialization. While the productive economy has languished, become ever more dependent on outsourcing uh, and, and the, those long and extremely tenuous and linear supply chains that Ms. Lagarde refers to. So, so Absolutely. I mean, the, so she she recalls it as some sort of a distant previous crisis. No, it's still the crisis today. It's not been resolved. The path that Ms. Lagarde and people like her have chosen to get out of that crisis has not worked. And that you should also we, we should also all put her remarks in that context. And you also mentioned the whole point about how she said, you know, we should not. Uh, uh, we should not uh, 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 repeat the mistakes of the 1970s. What does she take to be the mistake of the 1970s? It is this. She thinks, and uh, by the way, this is also the official story in the United States, that essentially the, the, the predecessor, Arthur Burns, the predecessor of Paul Volcker as the chairman of the Federal Reserve, essentially did not nip inflation in the bud when he should have. He allowed things to get out of control. And this is essentially, I think, as you rightly intuit, Ben, this is just a, a sort of a, a way of putting the problem in the 1970s that conforms to the general narrative of how central bankers have been as mrs ms lagarde says you know playing the orchestra of 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 the world economy in a wonderful way keeping inflation low and employment levels high and so on and so forth but this is complete and utter nonsense. Inflation, as you as then as now, has completely independent reasons. And as in fact, in other places, she recognizes that inflation, and as Borrell and others have recognized, inflation was kept low thanks to factors that were completely outside the control of central bankers. And she does something else here as well. She says, you know, uh, 
because of that so so then she re to return to her narrative about the mistakes made in the 1970s she said we should not make these mistakes because they can be costly what does she mean by that she means that once you get inflation that has gone out of hand then the only thing you can do and that's her story or one of the things you can do is uh, 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 Western bankers generally prioritize increasing interest rate, essentially increasing interest rates to such an extent as to create such a deep recession that inflation is wiped out. But this, of course, has been uh, 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 described by many prominent, more progressive economists as essentially burning the house to roast a pig. You shouldn't have to do that. You should be able to have an oven that roasts your pig or a fire that pit that roasts your pig. So Ms. Lagarde is also shows some recognition that this is a problem. So she is basically saying that in addition to monetary policy, which she does think has a role to play. So she basically says, you know, we should uh, we should have higher interest rates. They will cause pain, although they should we should try to mitigate this pain. So the working class, who is the main sufferer in all this, is going to suffer. But then she says we can try to mitigate this suffering by attacking uh, the problem of supply and she says we should engage in reshoring and creating more resilient supply chains and friend shoring which is now increasingly another big buzzword among western policy makers so here they are finally accepting that some kind of industrial policy some kind of state intervention is necessary to make the productive structures of the western world more resilient and prima facie, it looks as though this is a turn away from neoliberalism. But I suspect that as in the United States, you will also see in Europe, it will just become uh, industrial policy itself will take a neoliberal form where industrial policy just becomes another trough at which the big corporate fat pigs can go and feed in the form of subsidies and uh, tax incentives and so on, as the Inflation Reduction Act has done in the United States. So they will take the name of industrial policy, but what they will actually implement is just another set of policies which favor the power uh, of big corporations, the power and 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 their, their, their ability to retain control over the investment prerogative and so on. This they are not going to change, which means ultimately for all this wonderful talks that Ms. Lagarde can give, they are not going to be able to get a grip on inflation. Yeah, I wanted to ask you about those comments that she made later on in her speech where she acknowledges the importance of securing resilient supply chains or diversifying energy production. If fiscal and structural policies focus on removing supply constraints created by the new geopolitics, such as securing resilient supply chains or diversifying energy production or saving on energy, we could then see a virtuous circle of lower volatility, lower inflation, higher investment, and higher growth. Those are clear references to one. When they say, when they say global supply chains, they mean China. I mean, every single part of the global supply chain is China. There are other countries involved, but I mean, the role of China in these global supply chains cannot be overstated. It is so. She's acknowledging with this, as she refers to increasing rivalry between the U.S. and China, or as we would say, the new Cold War that Washington is waging on Beijing. It's going to create supply chain issues for Europe if it decides that it wants to sacrifice its own economic well-being and side with Washington. And when she says diversifying energy production, she's clearly referencing the fact that Europe had been Rely, heavily reliant on Russian energy. Russia was the largest energy supplier to Europe before these Western sanctions in the past year. And despite that, I mean, Russia remains a very important energy supplier directly to some countries and indirectly through selling its energy to India and other countries below market value. And then they just sell it up. They sell it above market value to uh, Europe. So Europe's just paying more for Russian energy anyway. But um, I'm wondering if you could respond to her warning that Europe has to be more sensitive to supply chains and energy production because she acknowledges that this also has contributed to inflation. So it's clearly not simply a matter of interest rates and wages. 
Yeah, I mean, you know, I, I really wonder that at, 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 and I'm, I'm sort of read her speech very carefully in order to try to see what she is bringing in terms of a unique European perspective. So as you and I both noted, she does at an important place refer to the strategic autonomy of Europe. But in most other respects, it doesn't seem to me that she is quite cognizant of what it would take for Europe to really achieve strategic autonomy. So on the one hand, yes, she's talking about resilient supply chains and she's talking about uh, diversifying energy resources. But what is uh, this other than to say that the European economy must be more tightly integrated into that of the United States? Uh, and, and of course, this sort of choice is hardly going to create strategic autonomy for Europe. In fact, it is going to tie, it is going to essentially uh, 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 essentially yoke uh, your, the European car to an extremely sick donkey that is the, well, maybe that's a bit of an exaggeration, but it is not exactly a very good animal that is going to pull the Europe out, which is the United States economy. The United States economy is not doing very well at all. It is highly monopolized. It is not really producing too many things that the rest of the world wants, whereas China is, and so on. And if Europe really needs it, so, 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 Re re becoming reliant more on uh, uh, the small uh, on the United States and a small number of other countries that will, will be willing to go along with this and also diversifying energy resources, which means essentially becoming reliant on American LNG, which is more expensive. And very importantly, it is ecologically far more destructive, you know, uh, contributing many times more to uh, the uh, uh, climate warming than uh, relying on Russian gas would have done. So in all these ways, I think that Ms. Lagarde is, is kind of operating under some sort of delusion about what strategic autonomy of Europe will look like. And, and one final thing I say is that, you know, towards in, in closing, she, she says, you know, that the euro will take its seat next to the dollar, etc. And she seems to imagine that this will be done somehow unproblematically uh, by essentially imitating the dollar system. But we've already gone through the contradictions of the dollar system. If the Europeans try to imitate that, including, as she says, by accelerating the European Banking Union, whose prospects I wouldn't put a lot of money on. The European Banking Union has been attempted for a long time and it has always stalled uh, uh, mainly because, you know, uh, uh, the European countries, which are quite a few in number, uh, uh, it's very difficult to get them all to agree on a set of rules that would work for all of them. And in this context, the diminution in the authority of Germany and France, which we have also seen within the European Union, isn't going to help. But anyway, Ms. Lagarde wants to proceed further and she thinks that the european that the euro can be uh, uh, play a world role just the same way as the dollar has she again is not taking into account the many many contradictions of the dollar system so in these ways you know it's amazing how somebody who is running such an important institution like the european central bank should be so ignorant of some very very basic facts which even her colleagues such as mr borrell know very well yeah and um Another interesting note that she made toward the end of her speech was about the rise of swap lines. And here we can see that she's hinting that central banks, she says, have an important role to play in trying to integrate the European financial system, which, as you noted, this has been something that, that the Eurozone has tried to do for many years unsuccessfully. But she says that central banks have a, a, an important role as protagonists. And then she discusses the increasing use of currency swap lines. And she specifically talked about the People's Bank of China, China's central bank, setting up 30 bilateral swap lines with central banks and other countries to provide them with liquidity in renminbi specifically. So these are essentially loans that instead of using an international financial institution or a commercial bank, they're ba basically loans made directly through the central bank of the country in other currencies than the dollar. And she's hinting that potentially the European Central Bank could do the same. Well, the, by the way, the ECB has been doing the same. They have been providing swap lines. But I wanted to make an important distinction. Now, what's funny is she acknowledges this in her speech, but in the same speech, Lagarde on multiple occasions emphasized the importance of central banks being independent, which is a core tenet of neoliberalism. They have to be independent so they can be run by unelected, unaccountable neoliberal technocrats. Whereas the People's Bank of China is not independent. The People's Bank of China is run 
on behalf of what's good for the Chinese economy and the Chinese working class. So they were talking about two fundamentally different institutions. He's essentially saying that the Chinese are doing it. We have to also do it. But the Chinese central bank is not motivated by the same economic ideology and it, and it doesn't serve the same economic interests as the European Central Bank. Yeah, absolutely. Like, you know, I mean, in a certain sense, when you point to that, and you're absolutely right, there is this paragraph here, which says that we should do, uh, you know, even the People's Bank of China is doing swap lines and so on. I mean, as we've already said, you know, the European financial structure is is quite different from the American. And uh, this has already created a lot of friction um, and, and, and problems. Now, in this, you know, and, and so, so number one, Yes, insofar as the euro plays a certain role in international trade and in international finance, etc., uh, in times of crisis, yes, swap lines should be made available so that uh, you know the currency that is necessary, that is to say, euro currencies, uh, the euros are available to countries that rely on having access to euros and so on. There's nothing that, that, that's unproblematic, and as Ms. Lagarde says, even the People's Bank of China does that. But the People's Bank of China, insofar as it is internationalizing the rent. Minbi, which it is, it is doing that on a very, very different model from that of the internationalization of the dollar. The dollar system uh, and its internationalization, as I said, has relied on excessive financialization, uh, which is extremely unstable and volatile. Whereas the ECB, as you rightly say, uh, uh, sorry, the, uh, the People's Bank of China, as you rightly say, is based on a very, very different model. Its, uh, its financial system is focused on production. It, and 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 trade and all the things rather than asset price inflation so with this orientation the internationalization of the renminbi will always look very different including the fact that i'm sure that the chinese will keep capital account management in the forefront of their management of of the renminbi that is to say they will not have free capital flows they will manage them and i think that's the thing to do that's that it's important to do that so the ecb then is in between these two models and what's really interesting is that historically european financial institutions are in many ways productive oriented in much the way that China's is. But lately, particularly over the last couple of decades, they have gone more in the direction of financialization. Particular, but particularly after 2008, when they got badly burned, when they sort of essentially gorged on the US's toxic securities and, and, and then suffered the Euro, Eurozone financial crisis as a consequence. Since that time, I would say that presumably a number of financial actors within Europe are conscious of, of this. And so if, if it were really possible to have a proper industrial policy, not the sort of corporate, uh, 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 you know, feeding the big corporate pigs, as I was saying, if you if instead of that, you have a real industrial policy, and then you internationalize the euro on a different basis, then yes, there is some possibility of strategic autonomy for Europe. But this is something we will have to wait and see. I don't see that much uh, here in this speech that makes me think that this is the likely course of action on the part of the Europeans. Yeah, I, I agree with you. There's no indication of that. And if you look at the political and economic track record of figures like Christine Lagarde, I mean, again, she was the French finance minister and pursued a decidedly neoliberal program. Well, I mean, maybe not compared to the US, but compared to previous French governments, uh, she was then the director of the International Monetary Fund, which we all know is one of the key institutional pillars that maintains the neoliberal system. And now she's at the European Central Bank. Well, I thought that the logical way to end this discussion, which I think has been very insightful, is with the way with the quote with which Lagarde ended her speech, which is actually paraphrasing Ernest Hemingway. And this is Again, a point that she makes throughout her speech about the rise, the not, not, not just the rise, but the increasing acceleration of the multipolarity in the world. And she says that in Europe, we have to respond to changing geopolitics now, not when fragmentation is already upon us. Instead, before. And then she quotes Ernest Hemingway, who said, fragmentation can happen two ways, gradually and then suddenly. We need to be ready for the new reality that may lie ahead. The time to think about how to respond to changing, ge to, to, respond to changing geopolitics 
is not when fragmentation is upon us, but before. And I would like to paraphrase someone whom I have read extensively and who spent a good share of his time in Europe, Ernest Hemingway. Fragmentation can happen in two ways, gradually and then suddenly. So this is her acknowledging that the changes we see geopolitically and economically in the world now could potentially be the opening salvos of even more profound shifts. And I, I definitely take her remarks and the remarks that Macron has been making in that larger context. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I guess I can simply end by by saying that, you know, uh, reading that last uh, uh, passage, it kind of makes you aware that essentially what Ms. Lagarde is doing is she's saying, look, I'm a central banker. This is the way the, the challenges look to me like for Europe in particular. And she's communicating this to an American audience. So uh, obviously she must balance any, you know, she, she can't sound particularly anti-American in any way, but you can see here the some seeds of a realization that what Europe needs to do, particularly with having some sort of industrial policy, with uh, 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 acknowledging multipolarity, etc., that what Europe see, needs to do is not necessarily just cleave to the United States, but it's not clear that she sees a very clear path forward for Europe. Yeah, and, and I think that's a good note to end on because as I've said at the beginning, I think it is important to highlight the comments that some of these European leaders like Macron have made, but I think it's also important to maintain a degree of skepticism because as I pointed out in a previous report that I did, Europe claimed that it was going to challenge the US government's unilateral sanctions on Iran when Donald Trump unilaterally withdrew from the Iran nuclear deal in 2018. In 2019, Europe even created the so-called INSTEX, which was an instrument to do trade with Iran. And they actually basically did nothing. And in January of this year, they closed down the INSTEX permanently. So that was basically a completely failed attempt by Europe to show its strategic autonomy. And as I pointed out, clearly Europe's trade relationship with China is significantly more important than its trade relationship with Iran, but the political pressure from the United States on Europe is also significantly greater. For the United States, containing China is a way higher priority than containing Iran, although it's certainly waging war against both of them. So I think it is insightful and, and interesting and important to listen to and analyze what the European political class is saying. But uh, again, I don't have too much stock in, too much confidence in, in their ability to actually pursue an independent path. We'll see. It, it, we are living in interesting times. And I want to thank you, uh, Radhika Desai, a brilliant geopolitical economist, the author of the book, Geopolitical Economy. Um, Radhika is a professor in the Department of Political Studies at the University of Manitoba and a regular uh, collaborator and friend of Geopolitical Economy Report. In the description below, I will link to the show that she hosts every two weeks with Michael Hudson, which is Geopolitical Economy Hour. I always really appreciate her insight. It's very valuable. And unfortunately, with you know Western media these days, we're not going to get much critical coverage. So um, Radhika, any, any final thoughts? Thank you for joining. No, I think you put it very well at the end. And let's just wait and see what what Europe now does, because the pressure on Europe is increasing. It's in a pincer to do what the Americans demand is essentially amounts to agreeing to the destruction of the European economy. How long can they withstand this contradiction and what will be the form in which they try to emerge from it? These are the big questions. Great. Well, thank you, Radhika. And I will be back with Radhika for our series based on her book, Capitalism, Coronavirus and War. And of course, she she appears here regularly for her own show, Geopolitical Economy Hour. I want to thank everyone. Whatever platform you're on, please subscribe to help promote this in the algorithm. And I'll see everyone next time. Thanks a lot.